about termination is to give you confidence because I think you can respond uh, much more professionally and cool and calm and collected if you are just a contract guru and have lots of confidence. So the reason for talking about terminations is to give you confidence. And that should lead to more serene with our pretty little flower moments <laughs> because you're super confident. So, all right, here we go. So the first thing I wanna be sure you're aware is that this contract is a buyer-friendly contract, hugely buyer-friendly. And I am so sorry that that's true. I know some of you are representing your sellers and it's very irritating. Well, when will I know for sure this contract is solid? Well, you will know for sure when the seller shows up at the closing table to buy it and not really one moment before. We will talk about timeframes and, um, you know, some certain things you can do to help be sure they're going to show up to close. But if they just balk at the last minute, <clears throat> it's, it's very hard for the seller to be sure. So I wanted to show you there are 38 buyer outs in the contract, and there is one for the seller, one. And it is, as written, the failure of the buyer to deposit earnest money. That's the only time in this entire contract that it says seller may terminate. The phrase buyer may terminate is in there 38 times. <laughs> and seller may terminate is in there once. So let's just start with, okay, that's the truth. <laughs> when nobody's asking us if, they if we love that or hate that or how we're gonna use that, it's just the truth, buyer friendly. All right, <clears throat> then let's look at certain things in the contract that are popping up all the time and that I think are particularly relevant to you guys in Denton Wise, right? Those counties, natural resource leases. So this says seller will deliver, seller has delivered or seller shall deliver or buyer may terminate. It doesn't say well, the seller doesn't remember who's got that lease. The seller doesn't want to go up in the attic and look for it. Seller doesn't want to do that. Seller doesn't want, nah, nah, nah. that's not what it says. <laughs> it says seller shall. So seller shall or buyer has the right to terminate. Very simple. Doesn't mean buyer will terminate. It means they can terminate, right? Doesn't mean they will, means they can. And so, I wanted to be sure that you understood that because in our world, I live in Denton County, in our world, right? Natural resource leases are a thing. We got ourselves some natural gas leases in our territories. So we wanna be sure we know that the seller, I just don't want to, is not is putting them at risk and it's a risk they're choosing. So I wanted to be sure you knew that. All right. <clears throat> So these days, interestingly enough, we are seeing some buyers who don't deposit earnest or option. And so what happens if they don't do that? Well, okay, Sarah, can you see those people entering the waiting room? Okay, great. I'm admitting them. Okay, great. Because it's ding dinging on my end. So <laughs> stopping to check. Thank you. If I leave my presentation and then come back, I have to stop screen share, do the whole thing over again. So it's a pain. So thank you. So what if the buyer doesn't deposit earnest or option? Number one, you still have a contract. The contract is the signed document. Doesn't matter if they deposit earnest or option. If they don't deposit earnest, then you can see here in 5C, then the seller, that's the seller's one place where it says seller shall, can terminate, right? Seller has to terminate quicker if after three days, if the, seller, if the buyer has not deposited earnest money, then seller can terminate. It's absolutely true. It's a box you can check on the seller's termination and I'll show you. If they don't deposit option, that just means they didn't need the option period in order to get out of the contract. They are going to use, either they're going to 
not they're going to object to something on the HOA that they receive or their lender is prepared to decline the loan or they're going to get out some other way. <clears throat> if they don't pay the option period, the only thing that happens is they don't have the unrestricted right to terminate. It doesn't mean they lose every other right to terminate. Just that option, right? That's all it means. So we are having a rash of buyers who don't deposit earnest or option. And I'm sorry that we are, but we are. And so you just need to be smart enough to know that then after three days, your seller is allowed to terminate as long as they terminate before the buyer deposits the earnest money. Okay. All right. And then we're going to talk about, this is paragraph 6D. So sometimes I see people write in 6D, single family residential. And to me, that's just silly. You're in some neighborhood with a postage stamp lot, and it's been single family residential for 20 years. Well, <clears throat> during this buying process, you're not suddenly going to uncover that that isn't allowed. Now, there may be different kinds of property, right? More rural, less clear than single family residential may, may fit there. The real thing that should go there is what is your buyer going to do with it? So your buyer wants to build a workshop. Your buyer wants to raise llama. Your buyer wants to build a big old tall garage for their RV. Your buyer wants to have ham radio antennas. Okay, do you hear the kinds of things that can go in paragraph 60? We don't use it often enough. So the workshop, that's a perfect example because maybe the survey will show an easement that would prevent them from doing that. Maybe some piece of information the buyer uh, gathers during the option period or even after the option period would show them they can't have electrical run there right? All kinds of things can happen. So you can see then buyer must object the earlier of the closing day or blank days after buyer received the title company information and the survey. So if you represent the buyer, who, what should you do? Nothing, because then they have all the way up to closing date to object. Do you see that right here in 6D? Buyer must object the earlier of the closing date or, oops, right? Don't do anything if you represent the buyer. That gives the buyer all the way up to closing date. What if you represent the seller? Ah, definitely put days in, right? They have to object within three days after they receive the commitment, the exception documents and the survey. And then they can object to something that restricts them from the use that they put in paragraph 6D. Okay, so 6D is one of those way under you way underutilized paragraphs. This can be a great place to put how your buyer is going to use the property. We <clears throat> have a lawsuit right now over ducks, and this isn't Denton. This is another office, but. They put in raised ducks into this blank. Great job, really good job. Uh, they can raise ducks there on this property. They just can't raise them commercially. Ah, so now we're having a, a lawsuit. I think it'll get settled out of court, but we're having a conversation about the fact that, oh no, the HOA allows you to raise ducks. It just doesn't erase you. It doesn't allow you to raise ducks that you then sell. So very interesting how this is used. If you guys are not using it at all, you're missing an opportunity to protect both your buyer and your seller, right? You, a buyer who writes something in there, that's wonderful. That's even if they just write single family residential, then later if they wanna object to something else, they should have written it in 6D. So very much a good paragraph that we don't use enough. All right, so 6E7 is about PIDs, right? PIDs and MUDs, all of that notice, the important thing to know is that you must give it 
before contract execution or the buyer can terminate all the way up to closing. So PIDs and MUDs are all over uh, Denton County and Collin County and Lantana, right? Lantana Trophy Club. Oh gosh, just everywhere. Um, and this, the notice must be given prior to execution or the buyer can terminate all the way up to close. So you need that notice. It's, it's a part of the listing agreement and the new listing agreement came out, right? So the new listing agreement asks specifically if it's in a pit or mud. So you should get those notices from the district, from the mud district or the pit district when you list the property so that you have it and you give it prior to execution so that this is not an out for the buyer. Okay, here we go. 7F, <clears throat> all right, buyer walks through, buyer thinks the seller did crappy repairs. Oh no, now what do we do? Does buyer have to buy crappily repaired home? or what happens. So the buyer does have a right to insist on the exact repairs that were agreed upon. So <clears throat> if it says air conditioner to be repaired to fully functioning, then air conditioner must be repaired to fully functioning. If it's functioning, but your buyer just doesn't think it's very good, that may not that may not be enough for them to get out of the contract, right? That may mean seller did perform exactly what seller is obligated to perform. And be aware that the contract terminates at closing. So don't assume they're gonna finish it later. Well, they said they were gonna have that HVAC guy come on back out. I even have that in an email that they're gonna have that guy come on back out. No, 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 we need, money in escrow or something to protect the buyer. Don't have your buyer go close unless they are ready to close or unless there's a document or escrow agreement or something signed at closing to protect the buyer because the, ter the contract terminates at closing and buyer won't win. So one of the first things that happened to me when I became a broker for more than two people was that the contract said seller would credit buyer $5,000 at closing. Everybody went to closing and closed and there was no $5,000 credit from seller to buyer. Buyer then realized it, buyer's agent was very upset with themselves, everything. There is no route to get that money back. The contract terminates at closing. So if there's some agreement in the contract or in an amendment, or to the contract documents, it all terminates at closing. So you better be sure you like what you're buying because you are buying it on that day. Okay, all right, here we go. This is the new <clears throat> buyer's walkthrough form. I really want everybody there using it every time. It's even better now. I love this so much. Buyer acknowledges and accepts the current condition of the property buyer either had it inspected or not. They've verified the repairs to their satisfaction. So they've either had it reinspected or they called the guy on the receipt or they've done something or they haven't, but they're acknowledging that it was their choice. They're either walking through or not. So if they're not gonna walk through before closing, still have them sign this. There's the choice, D2. Buyer chooses not to walk through. Great, just choose not to walk through, but get it documented that you offered and they didn't have the choice. And then look at E, which is new now. Buyer chooses not to visit or review the property in person. And that's because we're having so many people buy homes that have never seen them in person. So we just want to verify that they're okay moving to closing even if they've never been in the home personally. So trust me, this form is your friend. It's absolutely about protecting you and the steps you took. 
So this is a great form. If you're working with a nice cooperative buyer's agent, you have the listing, getting this form is huge too. I would always ask. Suggest it a few days before closing because it protects that other agent too. And then ask for a copy. They don't have to give it to you. It's not a rule. You can't have a fit about it, but you can ask in a certain amount of the time you will also receive it, all of which is great protection. Okay. All right. Closing. So people think that if they don't close, the only thing they're risking is their earnest money. And that's just not the truth. So I thought we should stop and remember that paragraph 15 says that the buyer, the seller can enforce specific performance, which means they can make the buyer buy it, seek such other relief as is provided by law. Well, what does that mean? Well, today what it means is that if the seller goes back on the market and has to sell for less, your buyer could be responsible for the difference. What about if that seller was going on to buy another home and now the interest rate they have to pay on that other home is higher? Your buyer who defaulted could have to pay that difference over 30 years, right? These damages can get huge. So your buyer thinks, I just don't feel like buying it today after all. I'm gonna let them have my 2,500 in earnest money. And the truth is the seller can agree to that or not agree. The seller can sign that release or not sign that release. The seller can sue to force the buyer to buy or to make up all these damages that seller might incur. So please make sure your language matches the truth of the contract. It isn't about the earnest money. They shouldn't enter a contract to buy a home unless it is their intention to buy the home, right? All right. And then third-party financing, the buyer is obligated to apply for this financing. So the buyer cannot just change from conventional to FHA because they feel like it. If it is a conventional contract and the buyer shows up at closing with an FHA loan, the buyer is in default. They're in default. The seller is not obligated to accept that. So big deal. And then I want to be sure you are all understanding paragraph two. So paragraph 2A is buyer approval, their credit worthiness, their job, their income, right? the buyer approval within that many days and availability of specified loan terms. So if back here you put 5%, then here 5% has to be available to this buyer or they can terminate within that number of days because they're not able to get the financing that they applied for, right? So that's 2A. 2B is property approval. It's not just the appraisal. It's also condition. It's repairs. So if the seller says, no, I won't put a new roof on, probably the buyer can terminate right here. And that's up to three days before closing. Lender can send a letter saying, no, I'm sorry. I won't loan on that house because the seller wouldn't put on a new roof. And then the buyer is out get their earnest money back. So 2A is buyer approval. 2B is property approval. The lender agreeing to loan on that property. And then be very aware of cash scammers right now. This is going on like crazy. Uh, the Louisville board actually sent out a notice. Um, they're sending out pre-approval letters or proof of funds. And when you call the number on the letter that you get, someone even answers, but it's all a scam. So if you get proof of funds from Chase Bank, don't just call the Chase Bank number on the letter, call Chase Bank that you can get off of Google, right? So do one step even more because it's kind of crazy out there. HOA is a way that people are getting out all the time now. Notice that um, the box one says seller shall 
obtain the HOA information and give it to the buyer within a certain number of days. If they don't do that, then buyer can terminate anytime prior to receiving the information. Whenever they receive the information, then they still have three days to terminate and get their earnest money back. So the HOA stuff is actually a big deal. I know the title company does it, right? I, I totally get that. <laughs> But that's not what the contract says, right? The contract says seller shall, or you could check the uh, buyer shall, but seller shall. So we don't owe money on this. I don't remember. Good. Thank you, Sarah. Um, okay. So this is either seller shall or buyer shall, because the title company isn't a part of this contract right? The title company is not a party. So we can't make the title company deliver HOA docs on time. It's really up to the seller to make sure they do if this box A1 is checked. Okay. Uh, shoot. Okay. Hang on. Be patient. Okay. And then these are the actual terminations. Isn't this funny again? Remember when we talked to the very first slide about buyer friendly? Okay, buyers have seven customary used all the time ways to terminate and then an other line. The sellers have one way to terminate and then other. <laughs> so this is a buyer friendly contract, not a seller friendly contract. And if you're terminating, you need to put the reason why, right? And then the release of earnest money is a second piece of paper. This is a full release. If a party is considering further legal action, they should not sign this. This is a full release. And then you wanna know, well, when can the seller relist? Well, if there's not a release of earnest money, we don't really give advice about when they can relist. It is a truth that every day sellers put their house back on the market and go to a different title company and close. But we don't give that advice because actually until the release is signed, the buyer has all kinds of options that they could try to do. So you can also have the title company write up an addendum to the release of earnest. So let's say your buyer really just is in default and the seller has storage expenses, hotel expenses, they have some expenses they want. And your buyer says, I'll give you $10,000. I'll give you the earnest plus 10,000. And, and the seller says, okay, let's do it. You can use this for the earnest money and most title companies will write you an addendum that says this is an addendum to the release and buyer is also or seller is also going to give $10,000 and here's the receipt. Here's saying that we've received it. Okay, so that's also possible in this crazy world of so many people just balking. It's good to know this is possible. All right, and then study paragraph 18, if you get in a bad situation, right? This is the 15 day clock. So your client needs to demand the earnest money to start the clock. Um, and then paragraph 18D, it can scare someone into signing, right? Any party who wrongfully fails or refuses to sign a release within seven days, may be liable to the other party for damages, the earnest money and reasonable attorney fees and all costs of suit. So if you know your client is absolutely not right, they're just mad, you might remind them about paragraph 18D and the same thing for the other side. If the other side is not right, they're just mad, just reminding them very professionally that 18D has already been agreed upon that can scare people into signing what they ought to be signed. All right, be the professional, just reminding you to move to written communication. Quit talking on the phone so much. Uh, follow up every conversation with written 
follow up, document every detail. Remember, it's the buyer and the seller only. It's not what you think. It's only what they think. Cut and paste to show exactly what the contract says. Is it okay to tell the other side why? If your seller has gotten a horrible health diagnosis or your seller lost their job that they were moving to in Florida, is it okay to tell the other side that? Now, the other side may not care, but at least you you can try, right? So sometimes why helps. And then de-escalate your mood. So we got a lot of agents out there who get all ramped up. Woo! You can feel them spiraling. And it's better not to talk to people then. Better not to talk, right? Just wait until your mood is de-escalated and then have a conversation. Because remember that frustration and anger, I'm so sorry, but they are a part of today. It is not shocking when people are frustrated or angry. It's kind of the norm. So we need to be better than that. My favorite thing to say right now is please don't treat people as they deserve to be treated. Treat them better than that. Right? All right, let's just look at the five levels of, of conflict and what it can look like for real estate, right? Problem to solve. First off, you see things differently. You don't see things the same way. Then we go to level two, disagreement. Language is guarded. And what we really believe is we believe you are wrong. It's your fault. Then we get to kind of a contest and we're trying to win, not come to resolution. And here's how I know when we're there because I talk to you guys and you say, this whole transaction has been like this. Let me tell you this whole long involved story about how horrible this person is. Okay, well, I don't, I don't really care how horrible the other agent is, right? I just need to know the issue at hand. And so that's how I can judge which level we're at. Because you want to tell me how terrible this, oh, this whole thing, that person is awful, right? Then number four becomes a crusade almost. They shouldn't even have a license. Shouldn't even have one. I hate them. So now we're gonna save the whole industry from somebody bad, right? And then number five is world war. I don't care what they file. I don't care what they do. They can just sue me. <laughs> okay, yep, yeah, here we go. So focusing on de-escalating and making sure that your mood comes down and that you try as hard as you can to go back to where you're seeing things differently. Who cares if they're right or wrong? Just go through the steps. There are steps. You don't need to scream at anybody. <laughs> Send a cut and paste the contract that they've already agreed to. And it's not you and the other agent, it's the buyer and the seller. So hopefully that will help. And then next week, we're gonna talk about lease listings and fair housing. So hopefully we'll, we'll be teaching you something about that just to make sure we all stay safe because fair housing is not TREC. Fair housing is the federal government and a whole lot bigger deal than you might be imagining it is when you're um, listing properties for lease. So, all right, does anybody have any questions about terminations? I feel like I raced through things, but I also wanna honor your time. So was that helpful just to show you the most often used paragraphs? Yes, and I just want to say that I appreciate you. Oh, well, that's kind. Thank you. I love yeah, that. Very informative. Good, 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 good. Yeah, thank you. That was great information. Oh, good, good. Well, I, I try to make it um, short, you know, so it doesn't take up your whole day, but also just get the info to you and then you can rewatch when you need to, but there's a lot of ways people are terminating right now, and it, it can be irritating if you aren't the pro. Anybody else? All right. I am happy to help you however I can. Um, 
I want to talk about things that matter to you. So also, if you have a topic that you want me to talk about, I'm very happy to, or a class that I need to teach, or whatever way I can help you the most. Um, I'm hoping that lease listings next week in, and how that ties with fair housing will be really important. So hopefully um, I'm hitting some spots that you need that you need right now. All right. Good. Thanks, I appreciate it. Okay. You guys are awesome. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right, thank, thank you. Uh-huh.